Secrets of the Ancient Scroll, the Wonderful Bible. Some years ago, a certain Stephen Marsh learned that his aunt had died and included him in her will. The will read, To my beloved Stephen Marsh, I bequeath my family Bible and all it contained, along with the residue of my estate. But after the debts were paid off, only a few hundred dollars of the estate remained. That money was soon gone, and all Mr. Marsh had left was a family Bible, which he put in a trunk in the attic. He had to retire on a small pension. He lived in poverty for nearly 30 years. Finally, in his 90s, he decided to move into his son's home. While packing his belongings, he ran across his aunt's Bible and began leafing through it. Mr. Marsh was astonished to find banknotes scattered through its pages. He counted thousands of dollars in cash, a very large sum at the time. The man had spent most of his life in poverty when he could have been rich. There was a treasure right at his fingertips in the Word of God. Is it possible that we, too, have an amazing treasure right at our fingertips? There are millions who believe that the Bible is the most incredible book ever written. In it, they find a clear picture of a loving God who desperately wants to save us, his children, and live with him in his eternal kingdom. People of every nationality, language group, and ethnic background have accepted God's Word as a life-changing, precious treasure, his love letter to them. But can the Bible really be trusted? Of course, no one questions the fact that the Bible is a fascinating book. Actually, it's 66 books written at different times by different authors over a period of 1,600 years. It's divided into the Old Testament, which has 39 books, and the New Testament, which has 27. 45 different authors wrote these books. Yet among them is an amazing agreement that can only be explained by a common source of inspiration. Most of these authors never knew each other. They were from different occupations, fishermen, shepherds, preachers, farmers, statemen, kings, and a physician. Yet there is unity and harmony among the books they wrote. This unity can only be explained by acknowledging God gave this book to us and inspired it in a miraculous way. Peter wrote, where prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21. Paul agreed affirming that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be completely equipped for every good work. 2 Timothy Chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The reason God chose this method of communication, speaking to us in written form, is that face-to-face -face communication between self and man became impossible because of sin. When God and man walked and to talked together in Eden, there was no need for a prophet to write down what God wanted man to know. But when Adam sinned, he hid from God, for he was fearful and guilty about what he had done. When God asked Adam where he was, Adam replied, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid. I hid myself. Genesis chapter 3. Since God could no longer communicate face to face, he chose to reveal what he wanted us to know through his prophets. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Amos chapter 3 verse. Around 1500 BC, God inspired Moses to write the book of Job and the first five books of the Old Testament, which together were often referred to as the law. By this time, Israel had become a nation of several million people, and now they would be able to read the Ten Commandments and the instructions God had given to Moses. But that was a long time ago. Is the Bible as we know it today still accurate and dependable? Until 1947, the earliest manuscripts we had of the Old Testament were copies from around AD 900. But then, a little Bedouin shepherd boy discovered a cave containing ancient leather scrolls preserved in clay pots. Soon, many more similar caves were discovered containing hundreds of hand-copied portions of the Old Testament. The Isaiah scroll found among them had been written in 125 BC, over a thousand years before the oldest manuscript that had been found up to that time. It contained the entire book of Isaiah. But did it agree with the later copies? Or had there been serious changes or copy errors made through the centuries? Sir Frederick Kenyon, president of the British School of Archaeology, reported that in one chapter of 166 words, there is only one word 
three letters in question after a thousand years of transmission. And this word does not significantly change the meaning of the message. The Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hand the true word of God handed down without essential loss from generation to generation throughout the centuries. Critics of the Bible, even as recent as a century ago, had found many reasons to raise doubts about the Bible. But these doubts have one by one been silenced by the shovels of the archaeologists. Until the 19th century, little was known about the ancient past except for what the Bible had said about it. No one could read the hieroglyphic writings of Egypt, for example, to decipher the record in history. But then, in 1798, Napoleon led, to, Napoleon led a military expedition into Egypt. Along with his soldiers, he took dozens of artists, linguists, and scientists to explore that intriguing land. Everywhere, they saw ancient relics containing unreadable messages. One of Napoleon's soldiers discovered that what became known as the Rosetta Stone, a black stone 4 feet 122 cm long and 2 and a half feet, which is 76 cm wide, this stone slab, now housed in the British Museum, played an important role in unlocking the secrets of Egyptian writings. It contained an ancient decree written in Greek, Demotic, Egyptian, and hieroglyphics. In 1822, a brilliant young French scholar by the name of Jean-Francois Champollion started the world by deciphering for the first time the hieroglyphics on the Rosetta Stone. Now the large collection of inscriptions was open for study and comparison. And not surprisingly, the stories they told confirmed the accounts found in the Bible. The stories they told confirmed the accounts found in the Bible. The stones cried out what the Bible had said was true. As archaeologists continue to dig, they continue to find evidence that confirms Bible history. Take for example, the discoveries at Tel Marduk. This is the site of the city in Ebla, in Syria, which was once a rich and advanced society of almost 300,000 people. In a school for scribes attached to the city's palace, 14,000 inscribed clay tablets and fragments were found, dating back to at least 2300 BC. More than a century of municipal records were written on those tablets. The Abla tablets are important for several reasons. First, because they prove without a doubt that written communication and language existed at the time of Moses and even long before, something that the critics had questioned for years. Second, they are important because they refer to both a creation story and a flood story with amazing similarities to the biblical account. And third, because they mention names and places that are mentioned in the Bible, names such as Abraham, Esau, Israel, and Sinai. But the real surprise in the Abla tablets was a mention of Sodom and Gomorrah. Prior to this discovery, there had been no historical reference to the cities outside of the Bible. Scholars consider them to be mythical sites that only existed in the Bible writer's mind. But once again, the Bible had been shown to be accurate and true. As King David said, Thy word is true from the beginning. Psalm chapter 119, verse 160. Until the 19th century, many scholars believed that Queen Semiramis built Babylon. But the Bible had dif said differently, quoting Nebuchadnezzar as saying, Is this not great Babylon that I have built? Daniel chapter 4, verse 30. So which is it, so wh which is it who really built Babylon? In 1899, Robert Coldway began digging up the old ruins of Babylon and covering tens of thousands of kinbake bricks bearing the stamp of King Nebuchadnezzar. His name was impressed upon the bricks that made up the walls and temples of the city. And a cuneiform tablet describing Nebuchadnezzar's achievements was also found by the archaeologists. On it, the king was quoted saying, The fortifications of Isagila in Babylon, I strengthened and established the name of my reign forever. And if this evidence isn't enough, the East India House inscription, now in London, devotes six columns of Babylonian writing to a description of the massive building projects of Nebuchadnezzar. The Bible's account was right all along. We shouldn't be surprised. God's words says, I, the Lord, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 19. Another mystery of secular history was the absence of Belshazzar as ruler of Babylon. The Bible names him as a ruler who witnessed the mysterious handwriting on the wall of the banquet hall. Was he only an invention of Daniel's imagination? 
History records that Nabonidus, who followed Nebuchadnezzar, trusted the throne to his son, Belshazzar, while he was away for a number of years. Tablets have now been discovered which confirm the existence of this individual named by the Bible. Here is what one of those tablets says. And as to Belshazzar, the exalted son, the offspring of my body, do thou place the adoration of the great deity in his heart. May he not give way to sin. May he be satisfied with life's abundance, and may reverence for the great divinity dwell in the hearts of Belshazzar, my firstborn favorite son. In the closing chapter of Daniel, we read the following. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book till the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. Knowledge would be increased, not only in the scientific world, but also relating to the accuracy of God's word. Bricks and cylinders, tablets and stone slabs, manuscripts and monuments, all confirm to the reliability and credibility of the Bible. But yet, another compelling argument exists for the trustworthiness of Scripture, its ability to accurately foretell the future. I am God, its writer declares, and there is no other declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. As God pulls back the curtain of time, revealing events far into the future, he demonstrates to the world that the Bible is not just another book. It is his book. Before Babylon had even reached the height of its power, God's book foretold its fall. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' pride, will be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 19. For his device is against Babylon to destroy it. Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 11. The name of the man who would lead the armies against Babylon was prophesied 150 years before his birth. So was the exact way in which he would do it. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, I will open before him the double doors. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 1. Were these very specific prophecies of the Bible fulfilled? In the Persian Hall of the British Museum stands the, Cyr the Cyrus Cylinder, discovered in the ruins of Babylon. On this clay cylinder, Cyrus tells of his conquest, and it confirms that Babylon fell just as the Bible had predicted. The Bible not only foretold the fall of Babylon, but it also predicted it would never be rebuilt. Babylon shall become a heap, Jeremiah chapter 51, verse 37. It will never be inhabited, but wild beasts of the desert will lie there and their houses will be full of owls. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. Only God could foresee the future and predict so accurately the fate of a then mighty empire. The explorer Austin Layard describes the site of ancient Babylon as he found it. Shapeless heaps of rubbish cover for many an acre face of the land, a naked and hideous waste. Owls start from the scanty thickets and the foul jackals cocks through the furrows. Discoveries among the ruins of Nineveh in Babylon, page 413. Of Babylon's former glory, nothing remains but its name on a signpost at the roadside in what is modern-day Iraq. The ruins reveal that the Bible is indeed true. We can agree with the prophet. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. And friend, if God can accurately pre predict future events hundreds of years before they happen, can we doubt for a moment his ability to know accurately our own future? You see, the Bible is more than just reliable history, accurate facts, and fulfilled prophecy. The Bible tells of a God who knows and loves you and me. It tells of a God who sent his son to die on Calvary's cross, to die for our sins, and to save us in his eternal kingdom. So it makes a difference to us personally if the Bible is dependable and accurate. Either Jesus, the Son of God, died on that cross for you and me, or he did not. Either he was who the Bible says he was, or he was not. And all the evidence points to the fact that yes, we can trust the central message of the Bible and its story for love and salvation for us. Perhaps the greatest evidence that the Bible is what it claims to be is the power of the book to change lives. The power is found in the person of the book, Jesus Christ. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are what which testify of me. John chapter 5 verse 39. Jesus was speaking of the Old Testament, for the New Testament had not yet been written. And as you turn the pages of the Bible, Old and New Testaments alike, you will discover 
that they prophesy a coming Messiah and tell of his mission of love and salvation. Jesus told his disciples, the, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, and all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. The entire Bible is a revelation of Jesus Christ, who came to show us what God is really like. The Bible contains an amazing power to change lives, transform human character, give strength to the weak, courage to the depressed, and hope to the dying. That is what, and that is why it is called the living word of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. All through history, the power of the Bible to change lives has been demonstrated over and over. Angry people have become peaceful, and wicked and immoral people have become pure and clean. Drunkards have been delivered from alcohol. Thieves have stopped stealing. You don't have to look far today to find hardened criminals in prison who have been changed into joyful Christians and found freedom in Jesus. Marriages headed for divorce have been saved and filled with new love through the power of God's Word. No one can read the Bible faithfully without God's book changing him or her. And if you spend time each day in God's Word, my friend, it will change you too. But that's because at the heart of the Christian religion is God's desire to change and transform lives. That's what Jesus spent his time doing. Through the power of his word, rebuking their fears and correcting their misunderstandings, lives were changed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John chapter 8, verse 32. It is truth that sets us free. The truth about ourselves, yes. Even more importantly, the truth about who God is, His unconditional love for us that is not based on our performance, His patience with us when we fail and make mistakes, His compassion for us when we're hurting, and His sympathy for our helplessness and our inability to change ourselves. The truth of who God is, as revealed in the Bible, is liberating and revolutionary. There is no greater power in the world to touch hearts and change lives. But God's Word can only change those who are willing to be changed those who are willing to accept Jesus Christ, the one the Bible truths draw their, our hearts to know and love. You see, the Bible is not just a book of ideology and philosophy, not just useful advice. It's God's love letter to you and me and his invitation to a personal relationship with him. Let me tell you a story of the power of God's word to change lives. Many years ago, there was a ship called the Bounty. In 1790, Captain Bly and his crew started out from England to bring a load of breadfruit tree to transplant in the West Indies as cheap food for slaves. Because of Bly's cruel leadership and mistreatment of his crew, there was a mutiny, and Fletcher Christian, the leader of the mutiny, set Bly and 18 of the crew adrift in a small boat. They managed to find their way back to England because of the expert ability of Captain Bly to navigate. The crew on the bounty didn't fare very well, but they ended up on the inhabited Pitcairn Island. They burned the bounty so they could not be traced. In Tahiti, Bly had taken on board a number of women and children and a few native men. Trouble followed the mutineers as they learned to make liquor. There were murderers and crimes, and before long, there was only one man left, John Adams, and a number of ch children and women. John Adams searched until he found the bounty's Bible, which had been stored away in a chest. He started reading it, and as he did, a tremendous change came over him. He realized that an important responsibility had come to him to provide a future for these children. He began to educate them on how to read and write and how to live. The amazing transformation in the entire population of the island attracted the attention of passing vessels, then the British government, and finally, the whole world. This Bible can change your life too, my friend. When we read the Bible, the same Holy Spirit which inspired the Bible writers to write down God's Word centuries ago transforms our lives as we study it. It is our privilege to study God's Word with an open mind and in simple faith. Say, O oh Lord, show me your truth and I will follow it. Reveal any changes I need to make in my life and I will choose to make them. Today, there is no more important decision you and I can make than to submit our hearts and lives to the authority of God's unchanging life. The Word of God is the only thing sure in this very uncertain world. It points us to an unchanging God who wants a deeper relationship with us. It points us to the way of life, the way of salvation, 
and tells us where we came from and what our destiny can be. For many of us, if we're honest with ourselves, there are some things in our lives that we just need to change. Maybe the Holy Spirit has been convicting you of some sin, some habit, some practice that you know is not in harmony with the Word of God. Just let go and give it to Jesus right now. We want to have a prayer together and pray about the decisions, the decisions we've just made. And I'm going to pray for you, especially for those of you who are struggling with the decisions the Word has brought to you after hearing this message. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Father in heaven, thank you for communicating your will to us through this wonderful book, Bible. Thank you for giving us Jesus to help us understand how we can live by your word and for giving us the Holy Spirit to apply it to our hearts. Today, we've made some decisions and we've made the decisions that we want to follow. We want to follow your word even when it calls for us to change our ideas, habits, or practices. Tonight, I want to thank you for those who have been convicted of specific things that your Holy Spirit is calling for them to change in their lives. Give them peace as they do your will. Give them strength to be faithful to your decision. Change our lives. Make them anew through the power that is in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.